All right. Uh, welcome back to Management 3064, Cornerstones of Entrepreneurship. I'm Ron Poff. Um, we're going to jump into Lecture 6 here in just a moment, um, and hopefully, hopefully all of you have uh, read the textbook and what Mullins talks about, uh, really good uh, with regards to gross margins. I want to recap uh, just briefly uh, the previous uh, module and modules uh, where we really focused on the revenue model and, you know, the keys, you know, from the revenue model is really looking at our value proposition, right? And um, certainly in that, within that value proposition, some, some key points, right? Who will buy? What will they buy, right? So who is the market? Um, kind of what their gains and pains are, right? From the empathy map uh, standpoint, and um, you know, beyond that, why will they buy, right? So, what, what, in what ways are there some gaps in the marketplace, right? Are you resolving some customer pain? Are you get? Are we giving them some delight that makes them uh, want to come to us? They're attracted to us uh, from that uh, standpoint. Um, and then beyond that is, you know, what's the um, What's their willingness to pay? How much are they willing to pay for something? Certainly, um, you know, in the in the previous module where Dr. Townsend talked about, uh, you know, something as simple as coffee with Starbucks, right? And and how much people are willing to pay for something um, from a delight standpoint, right? You know, for me, um, I'm not able to articulate the Starbucks story because. For me, I'm not the typical Starbucks uh, consumer. Um, I don't drink coffee, never have drank coffee. I uh, probably never will drink coffee. Um, I'm a tea drinker, but for me, I can go to the Golden Arches of McDonald's and pay a dollar and get 32 ounces of tea, right, versus Starbucks. Now, with that being said, the attraction for me, right, um, you know, uh, what will they buy? For me, Starbucks is... Um, the environment and the experience. So certainly I do, you know, I meet people there, networking and things like that. So the whole point, again, um, in the revenue model and really kind of looking at, um, you know, customer acquisition is really positioning our value proposition um, in such a way that we are attractive um, from a venture standpoint, product standpoint to the marketplace. So that's a, you know, that's a critical, critical element uh, from there. So now, as we move into lecture six, um, so certainly now that we have revenue, uh, we've got to build scalable gross margins. And, um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, our author, uh, John Mullins, uh, really does a good job at uh, portraying, right, through storytelling and others, um, and kind of taking this broad financial um, dilemma um, and challenge for many startups um, into a you know into a way of um, explanation that we can certainly understand and relate. Kind of want to share with you um, you know kind of a an interesting part. You know we we innovation now the word innovation over the last ten years has just taken on a whole different perspective. I, I mean obviously innovation has been around for hundreds of years. Uh, we'll talk uh, in, a, in a few moments whether that's, you know, leaps uh, or just steps. But at the end of the day, innovation's been around. And, you know, here we see this beautiful picture of, uh, you know, Tesla models and whether it's the Model X or the Model S or in the center here, the most recent uh, Model 3, you know, certainly organizations um, have to evaluate the marketplace in some ways, and then are looking at um, innovation um, in order to better meet uh, the pains of the consumers. In addition to that, perhaps there's pains internal, right, um, where innovation can certainly help. I mean, if you look at the Model X and the Model S, you know, on the left and right there, um, you know, those were those are very expensive uh, products. You know, ranging anywhere from ninety to $120,000. And for a sedan, um, that's a very expensive price point. Uh, that's coming from a guy that drives a Camry, right? Uh, so to me, a sedan is in that twenty-five dollars to 
dollar range. And so certainly when you when you have a multiplier of three to four, um, I'm not willing to pay, even though it is a very attractive vehicle uh, from that standpoint. So then you start to look at, um, and this is what Elon Musk and the team, uh, you know, the team of designers and engineers started looking at um, at Tesla was to try to use utilize innovation um, with the Model 3 in order to get it into more of a scalable, right, uh, marketplace, a uh, more uh, scalable uh, price point as well. So the goal was, is, was to try to have a product that um, had a little bit higher or certainly had a lot more higher volume at a lower price point. So the Model 3 is in that forty to $45,000 range and certainly the volume has picked up uh, from that. Um, obviously, along with that comes um, internal innovation, you know, whether it's automation, uh, the ability to buy at higher volumes. Um, so when you look at scalability within any organization and you're able to buy uh, more units, uh, for example, if we're going to buy more uh, wheels and tires and headlamps and things like that. Um, certainly you're able to buy it at a, at a much uh, different price because of the volume aspects of it. So, but innovation can be very expensive, right? It takes investment. Uh, for example, the company uh, that I work with right now uh, just made a, you know, a very large $15 million investment in Northeast Ohio. And, and um, that was really driven by trying to innovate the market and really change the dynamics um, you know, from a manufacturing standpoint and compounding standpoint uh, from a materials uh, development and materials compounding, you know, in the plastics industry. First time that this has been done probably in 25 to 30 years in, uh, you know, in that composites industry. And so it's a very expensive um, plan, right? $15 million is, is not, uh, not easy uh, within this market. But the whole point of it is, is the long-term gain um, through innovation, cost, quality, delivery, these types of uh, attributes will help to lower the, the cost, the cost of goods, right? And the goal here is, is if we lower our cost of goods, then certainly that should drive uh, higher profits. So the whole point here is innovation is expensive and we have to really understand that um, as entrepreneurs um, and, uh, you know, as business development, and product development professionals. Particular slide here, you know, we start to look at uh, product plus market fit, right? So this is truly trying to understand, um, are we developing the right product uh, for the market? Um, you know, we could come out with, um, you know, probably, you know, the next best toothbrush, if you will. Uh, but who is going to pay, you know, 40 or $50 for a standard toothbrush? Um, you know, and so we have to really try to understand um, the, the product and the, and the market fit based on our um, ability to, to drive hypotheses, right? Um, to be able to speak to the customer, to be able to listen to the customer in the market, uh, look at our competitors, and really be able to understand that. Um, but at the other, the other important part uh, part of this is just because we have the best product for the best market condition, that does not necessarily mean that uh, it's not sufficient to produce long term success. Okay. One of the other aspects of this from a long-term success standpoint is our ability to make a profit. You know, Our ability to make money um, really leads to that long-term su success, um, which is a very, very important. So really, if you look at it, we have to, we have to truly understand right, the cost of production and selling the product. You know, I work with a lot of uh, startups. I work with a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, some, some very small. Some on a, you know, a, certainly a medium to larger scale. Uh, one of my favorite ones are, you know, some wineries and vineyards, right? And you know, there's such there's such a focus to just get the product to market. Um, shelf space in that beverage 
um, and spirits industry is, is very, very tough. It's very tight. Um, and so people want to get to market as quickly as possible, right? Obviously with the best quality intentions and, and all of that. But in doing that, sometimes uh, entrepreneurs, and in this case, uh, you know, wineries and vineyards and things, they forget about the cost, right? So the bottling costs, the packaging costs, labeling, regulatory, um, you know, going through the various uh, testing and techniques, um, certainly looking at crops and the weather and the effects of weather. So all of these are interesting aspects that many times we forget about. Um, you know, and even manufacturers, um, you know, if we're, if we're on the Tesla uh, discussion, you know, certainly uh, Elon, you know, kind of got away from people and brought in automation. And it was a very nice looking robotic assembly line, very, very innovative and, and all of that. But at the end of the day, it was difficult to scale. And so, you know, he and the engineers there quickly realized that the cost of production was uh, was much higher because, quite frankly, they couldn't sell enough. So they actually brought more people in, right, um, and utilized a hybrid automation plus people um, in evaluating that. But if you look at the left here, and this is, you know, a model of Tesla since 2013, uh, 2019, this is the margin trends. And so what's kind of nice is, um, you know, certainly a good, relatively good gross margin, um, you know, around the 25, uh, 26% maybe in 2014, and it's kind of hovered around that. Um, it is, you know, to me, it, when I look at this, it's a, it's a good point to sort of be in that 25% gross margin range. However, um, at some point uh, with innovation and continuous improvement, you would want to see that gross margin line increase, okay? But part of the issue has been uh, the fact of, you know, if you look at the OPEX, um, in the early days there, 2013 to 2015, OPEX is operating expenses. And so um, Tesla was actually um, operating and spending more to make the vehicle than they were in, uh, you know, in being able to sell the vehicle. And so that's why you see the operating margins uh, really, you know, from a 5% and then down uh almost to minus 5% in 2015. Obviously, the blue and red lines, once they got a handle, once they got um, their cost, the OPEX, once they, once they got the cost under control, uh, um, they were able then to increase their operating margin. So the key point here is being able to understand the value proposition um, with the cost of producing the product. And there's a delicate balance, right? Uh, between the two. So we obviously want to get to market as quickly as we can. We want to sell as many as we can. We want to have a price point, in this case, uh, you know, a $40,000 Model 3, right? Um, so we have this, we have this uh, sort of constraint, if you will, of what the market will bear and, and being able to, um, to meet that. At the same time, we have to be focused on what our costs are and be able to find ways to take cost out, right? So whether that's, uh, you know, in better buying, uh, you know, contracts and, and purchasing and leveraging, uh, that could be one. Number two, you know, is it, are we able to increase production, you know, by uh, looking at automation and labor? Um, sometimes, unfortunately, we have to look at other costs and, and taking cost out um, without affecting quality and, and, and things like that. So, Certainly, uh, an important, um, you know, a, an important piece um, as moving forward from a focus standpoint for entrepreneurship. We start to look at the logic of a gross margin model, right? And uh, really, the logic fall follows that of an income statement, right? So we look at uh, we look at an income statement, and um, here in the upper left hand corner, you can look at revenue, right? So revenue models. Um, are focused, obviously, on total sales or revenue. We, we talked about that in the last uh, modules. So, you know, at the end of the day, the more that we can increase our sales or revenue, the better the probability, okay, of being able to make a gross margin, make a profit at the end of the day, right? 
So gross margin models um, really address the, the category of cost of producing or selling. And so, again, the last two modules, we focused on what the revenue should be. What are people willing to pay? Why are they willing to buy it? You know, kind of what is that price um, per pain or price per gain, as I always like to, to mention. Um, and now, though, um, once we bring the gross margin model into it, once we start having that discussion, not only is it about sales or revenue, it's now about cost as well. And so in this particular case, Alibaba Group, Alibaba is a Chinese uh, company, um, actually been around for tw at least 20 years or so. I, I remember uh, my jobs in uh, purchasing and sourcing back in the um, late 90s, early 2000s. Alibaba was a phenomenal, phenomenal tool for us to connect uh, with Chinese manufacturers. And it's still, to this day, many North American uh, companies, manufacturers, utilize Alibaba uh, as a bridge. So Alibaba serves you know, as a uh, facilitator uh, between a manufacturer uh, you know, and a company that has goods and services. And they sort of try to bridge that as a facilitator or, if you will, a broker in that standpoint. So one of the things to keep in mind is Alibaba is not a manufacturer. They don't produce anything, right? Uh, their service at the end of the day is just connectivity, uh, facilitation, um, and they're trying. That's what they they work on and really do. So here, uh, this is the 2017 financial highlights. So um, you know, if you look at uh, this, is just a year, year and a half or so ago. Incredible, 56% year over year total revenue growth. Um, from a core standpoint, so their core business, their commerce, was up 57%. Um, if you look in the quadrant there in the upper right, they you know they have a cloud-based uh, system, uh, computing system, and and more than doubled uh, that particular uh, part of the business, 104%. Um, it amazes me um, in the lower left-hand corner there the number of consumers. Uh, that they have. Um, if you look at that, that number exceeds the population of the United States, right? So it's a significant um, tool. They're a significant company in the B2B uh, world, um, again, through connectivity um, and being able to do that. One of the important parts to understand is, is that, um, again, they don't, so their cost of selling, right? Their cost of producing is, is very low, right? Um, they don't have to buy any raw materials. They don't have to manufacture anything. Um, you know, they're just, they're really bringing a service uh, to the point here. And so their profitability and cash flow is just amazing. Uh, if you look at 53% uh, and that's earnings before taxes and uh, appreciation. And um, the whole point here is, is, uh, uh, you know, they, they've had an incredible uh, growth from a profitability standpoint in the cash flow, $7.1 billion cash flow. And so they, you know, we, we look at Alibaba here as um, a total difference, right, between them and Tesla. Tesla, right, has to buy various uh, products and goods in order to produce, um, you know, produce their a car, and at the end of the day, um, they, uh, you know, from a Tesla point of view, have many, many constraints. Uh, from a cash flow, they may be paying suppliers, um, you know, per perhaps in a net 30, uh, net 60 uh, standpoint, but perhaps they're not getting paid. Obviously, from a uh, production standpoint and delivery to their customers, they may not get paid for another 120. 150 days, and so uh, they've got they've got more cash going out at some points um, within their financial models as they do more going out than they do coming in, and that can be very very troublesome, um, especially for investors looking at that um, and shareholders. Um, but you know we we look at this earnings before interest, taxes, and depreciation, and amortization. This is an important piece because. You know, that's before all of those elements are subtracted. And it does give us, uh, you know, an opportunity to 
to look at the operating profitability of an organization. Okay, um, so you know again, the, you know we look at the complexity of accounting and finance, and quite frankly, this is you know as an entrepreneur myself, uh, this is why I have a certified uh, public you know accountant, right? I have a CPA who helps uh, me understand um, a lot of these attributes and a lot of these uh, constraints and challenges in a much better way. And, um, you know, certainly for entrepreneurs, this can be a very important asset uh, within their organization is to, you know, look at having professional guidance and professional expertise um, so that they can maximize, for example, their EBITDA margin. Perhaps they can maximize their tax uh, incentives and, and look at the interest and, um, and, you know, ways of depreciation and amortizing certain uh, elements of their production into new equipment, and new uh, innovation and new uh, opportunities. And because at the end of the day, if we're, if as an entrepreneur, we're spending more time on doing, right, the tactical parts of an income statement or the tactical parts of our taxes, we're losing uh, time. It's an opportunity cost uh, because we're losing time where we could be focused on the customer, on the market, and other aspects. So what are gross margins? And, you know, the, um, our, our book actually within the first uh, few pages of the chapter of, you know, of chapter four talks about and gives us a very good definition um, of what uh, gross margins are. And, you know, really, at the end of the you know at the end of the day, gross margins. It's very simple. It's uh, revenues minus cost of goods um, or cost of producing a product. So we look at cogs, and that's cost of goods sold. Um, and so we look at what shapes that, and it's producing or selling a product. And so on the left hand side here, we look at PayPal. And again, uh, you know, PayPal has been around. Many of you probably have used PayPal. Obviously, there's a tie to Elon Musk. That's where he had been. It's kind of interesting to see. I mean, this is 2016 to 2017. So uh, probably more than likely they're on a fiscal year that is uh, October to October. Uh, just an assumption on my part. I'd have to look at it. But certainly their gross margins here are you know near 40%, right? Just, just a little bit south of 40%, which is very impressive. Uh, you know, especially uh, for an organization that has been around this this long, uh, they've done a nice job at maintaining a very good gross margin. What's interesting is, um, you know, that's nearly double of what Tesla is. So we we looked at Tesla a few minutes ago, and they're in that twenty five percent range from a gross margin uh, versus PayPal, right, where it's at forty percent. Just to put it in simple, you know, again, just to kind of outline what gross margin is, certainly if, it, if it's 20% and then that, you know, for every dollar of revenue that the company has, um, then we're, we're basically making 20 cents, right? So that's where the 20% comes from. So in this particular case, PayPal, um, if we look at September 30th, 2017, for every dollar um, that they were, that they had in revenue, they had 37, you know, almost 38 cents, uh, which is which is very, very good and, and a dramatic uh, piece from a gross margin standpoint. So how to calculate gross margins? And again, this is, uh, you know, this is a, a, certainly a, an area where the textbook, uh, very good identification and outlines it. Um, and obviously there's numerous technical rules for determining cost of goods sold. So again, the reason why, uh, you know, we stress that it's an important part to have someone on the organizational structure, um, that this is one of their expertise and or, you know, again, that's what uh, CPAs and other accounting firms are out there for. That's what they're in the business for. But the basic rule is it's the direct cost to produce and deliver one unit of sales for a product or service. So what does it take directly, okay, to uh, produce and deliver one unit of sales. Uh, it's important to remember, um, you do exclude any general expenses that are directly tied to operating the business, okay, versus those directly uh, tied to producing sales. So in this case is, you know, it's um, 
you know, it's the bolts, it's the tires, it's the wheels, um, it's all the aspects within uh, Tesla, right, uh, to directly produce that vehicle. Um, Alibaba, for example, right, when we looked at that, what goods or services do they have to be able to serve as the bridge? You know, and, and maybe it's some analysts um, or things like that um, or pieces of equipment. So when we talk about operating expenses, um, we can think about these expenses as supporting operational investments, okay, uh, that we make to support sales. So cost of sales, um, and that's, you know, when we think about, um, you know, how many businesses succeed and how many businesses fail, um, I would say failure a lot of times is focused obviously on not finding the right customers, not finding the right um, marketplace. Um, but a lot of times it's not really understanding the price point, okay? Um, and not only from the price point, now we have now we've brought in another element. Perhaps those companies failed because they could not control their costs. Um, and so that's a that's a very, very important aspect of that. So, you know, kind of looking at the chart here, uh, we look at the gross margin uh, model and we look at some hypothesis. We've, you know, in this particular module, we've looked at Tesla, Alibaba, and PayPal, uh, some very, very different types of organizations. Um, but you have to look at the product mix. And we talked about Tesla, you know, obviously they've got three different models and sort of balancing what that product mix looks like. Um, Alibaba, kind of focused, right, on being that bridge and facilitator with all of that. Um, the, our book, um, you know, talked about continuous improvement and, you know, the Japanese, um, you know, really brought this uh, particular concept to uh, the automotive industry back in the, uh, in the 80s, early to mid 80s. And quite frankly, the Japanese automakers, uh, Toyota, Nissan, most specifically Toyota, was really kicking, um, kicking butt here in the U.S., um, partly because the, their ability not only to have a, an excellent price point, uh, which, you know, again, you could have an excellent price point, but if you're not taking cost out of the vehicle, then you're not, your profit margins suffer, right? And your gross margin is impacted. So, um, you, know, as, as the, you know, as the book talked about in page 98, was looking at Toyota Motor Company's success and their ability on a day by day, I mean, down to day by day basis on a continuous improvement in Kaizen, um, you know, is really just trying to find ways to take cost out. And so continuous improvement is just that, um, looking at a very systematic, um, short term, step by step ways of reducing cost. And you know, as a manufacturer, again, where I um, spend my time and, and we work on, every dollar that we can save from a cost standpoint goes directly to the bottom line, right? Um, we could raise prices um, at the end of the day, but um, raising prices does not always deliver an immediate impact to the bottom line uh, because of the, all the expenses that um, that has to go through. But if you if you look at it from a, if you take cost out, right, there is an immediate direct impact to the bottom line. So um, obviously helps us from an operating expense standpoint um, so to that point. So we go back, um, customer willingness to pay. We covered that um, obviously in the last uh, couple of modules. Um, very, very important for us to balance that in our gross margin though, in our gross margin model um, is how much they're willing to pay uh, because the more if there is flexibility, if there's price flexibility um, and we can get a higher price, then that certainly improves our gross margin. But in many cases, right, uh, with whatever pricing strategy that we're going to use, if we go out with a higher price, the expectation is eventually that price will, customers will want to pay less, especially if we've got competitive pressures um, with, with regards to that. And so, uh, again, having a sensitivity, a focus um, on what customers are willing to pay is important. And I think we've just covered it um, in this particular module, obviously being um, hyper-focused, uh, or at least having some focus on cost of materials and cost of labor, uh, because those are an important parts of the outcome of our gross margin. Um, 
And again, this is an area where many entrepreneurs kind of get lost and, uh, and forget about. And obviously, it has a direct impact uh, to their gross margin. So last uh, concept here is the, you know, again, just kind of uh, emphasizing the importance of gross, model, uh, gross margins. If we look at the models here, um, the one on the left, obviously, is Amazon, uh, 1998 to 2008. And we're looking here at the uh, cumulative CFF. And what CFF stands for is cash from financing, right? And, um, you know, if you go back to the origins of Amazon, and I, I you know, and I, it's probably an unfair um, uh, an unfair analogy for me, but I, I just at one time kind of looked at Amazon as just an online bookstore. Okay, um, you know, and they were sort of competing against Barnes and Noble and Books a Million and and many others, and they did it incredibly well, right? Um, they still are an online bookstore, but obviously they've become so much more than that, and they've they've really have grown, but. In the early days, there was a lot of criticism. Um, you know, Amazon came, came out of the gate. Um, a lot of people liked what Jeff Bezos was proposing. Uh, they liked, obviously, if you go back to 1998, online commerce was sort of just coming around. I mean, it was, you know, it's, it's not quite, uh, it was definitely not what it is today. I mean, it's become, you know, part of our everyday life. But in 1998, go back to then, uh, this, was, this was a novel idea. Uh, buying something online and having it shipped to you in just a few days. And so there was all of this hype and excitement. But, you know, from 98 to, you know, really 2001, 2002, a lot of the investors were kind of frustrated because um, the revenue was kind of just equaling, equaling um, the cash from financing. And really they couldn't, they, they were sort of frustrated that Bezos and the team was not able to generate more revenue and really kind of reduce their financing. And then you can see that that finally started changing dramatically in 04, 05, and then, you know, obviously the rest on the chart there. Um, but again, um, you know, and, and if you look at Amazon's model, not much from an inventory standpoint. I mean, they put, um, you know, they put the inventory back onto whoever's supplying the product, whether you know, it's a book publisher, whether it's a manufacturer of certain goods. Um, actually, we're getting ready to start working with Amazon ourselves. And, you know, at the end of the day, there's not, um, there are fulfillment centers and warehouses today, uh, but a lot of that product is still owned by the company supplying it. So that's kind of an interesting aspect. Whereas if you look at Tesla, and uh, this is from 2011 to 2017, and you look at their revenue and their CFF, this is why there's a lot of pressure on Elon Musk, right, to turn things around. Because in this particular case, his uh, cash from financing is exceeding his revenue. And that is troublesome. You, there's, you know, obviously he has sustained this um, since 2014 and there's still patience and, you know, people understand and they give him a lot of uh, respect and they certainly have given him space um, to, to get things right. Uh, but at some point that patience could run out um, and perhaps the confidence in what he's trying to do um, is there. Now, keep in mind, you know, really what he is doing is pretty phenomenal. I mean, in the U.S., uh, we have not seen really a, a uh, standalone uh automobile company come out of the of North America in a hundred years. I mean the you know the ones that are still um, you know on the road today from a North American automobile perspective, um, you know, his his what, what came out a hundred years ago, Ford and General Motors and you know Chrysler, that sort of thing. Now certainly the uh, the Japanese uh, Europeans, you know, they've had innovation and um, but that you know spurred out in the last 40 to 50 years. And so Tesla's story here and I think that's why people are being patient and, you know, they understand his innovation and his dilemma. Um, and quite frankly, who else is trying to do it, right, uh, at the scale of what Tesla is doing. Um, and so it will be very, very important. In fact, it'll be interesting. Let's look at that chart on the right. It'd be interesting to revisit this chart three years from now and five years from now. And will it have a similar type of 
look as the one on the left, right? Now, obviously, um, it's pretty simple. Amazon and Tesla are very different companies, and this is sort of an apples and oranges comparison, right? But the whole point here is, is that there, we, as entrepreneurs, right, revenue we talked about is incredibly important, but the, the importance of gross models, controlling cost, right, continuous improvement, right, finding the right uh, price point, understanding the market, understanding, uh, you know, the market conditions and the consumer's willingness to pay, all of these things um, help us, especially when we need cash, right, to finance our ventures, especially when we need investments to, to uh, meet the customer's demands, especially when we need investors, right, to be able to scale our business. And so um, at the end, all of that coming together is an important piece. So with that, I'm going to close out lecture six. Um, if, again, as usual, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me uh, by email or uh, give me a call or send me a text. It's been a pleasure so far. And uh, we'll uh, look at Lecture 7 here in the next couple of days. Take care.